Muy buenas tardes. Por la última vez, les suplico que trate de moverse más al medio o a este lado, como ahí va a estar que leyendo desde el podio, pues entonces que es el último momento de hacerlo. Yo voy a hablar que bien poco aquí voy a dar el saludo que, que protocolario que en español y entonces cambio a inglés. Okay. que de parte del Instituto de Estudios del Caribe de la Facultad de Ciencias Sociales y su decana, que la doctora que Dagmar Guardiola y también que de la oficina del rector que nos da que, que, que mucho apoyo en ese proyecto, que el doctor Carlos Severino de la Biblioteca Regional del Caribe latinoamericanos, que es que en el, la biblioteca Lázaro aquí, pues entonces les doy que la, la bienvenida. Que es la hoy que tiene el oficio principal del Instituto de Estudios del Caribe, pero en este especial que también que tiene el apoyo del Departamento de Inglés y su programa doctoral que en estudios que caribeños y también que la ayuda del programa de estudios interdisciplinarios de la Facultad de Humanidades. Que muy bien. We are in front of a presence today, someone who has been the most popular and important writers of fiction and poetry in the Caribbean, the, particularly since the 1980s, but who has also been a very important editor and writer of nonfiction during that time. I'm going to just give a very, very brief listing of some of these things so that you get a sense of it. So I read her stories in undergraduate and graduate classes in Caribbean literature. Some of you may have encountered others of her work the, in, in other places. But the collection of stories, Summer Lightning, the collection The Arrival of the Snake Woman, the, the Discerner of, and the Discerner of Hearts, the poetry collections Talking of Trees and Gardening in the Tropics, and the more recent collection Shell, the, her, her, her recent novel, uh, an award-winning novel called Dancing Lessons that came out in 1914, 14, in, in, in 2014, excuse me, but I'm, I'm Showing my age, okay. The uh, and the <clears throat> the uh, and nonfiction works. The working miracles, women's lives in the English-speaking Caribbean, the A to Z of Jamaican heritage, the Encyclopedia of Jamaican heritage, and the message is change. And she's just brought out, and the reason she's really here on this campus is just published the, the story of West Indians in the building of the Panama Canal, and as many as 60 to 70 of the laborers who worked on the building of the American Canal were West Indians. So the, who built the Panama Canal? It wasn't Teddy Roosevelt, and it wasn't those American engineers, or even those doctors who went to, they solved the problems of malaria and yellow fever. The people who built the Panama Canal were from all over, as she says in her books, from, from more than 70 countries, but the great majority of them were from the West Indies, from Jamaica, from Barbados, from Trinidad, St. Lucia. So the, the great bulk of the workers, the people who actually dug the canal, they were in fact West Indians. And that book the, is also available, the, and it's called Dying to Better Themselves, West Indians in the Building of the Panama Canal. But today, we're not talking about history, the, or oral history, or, or documentary history. We're talking about embracing creativity. Olive Senior, the creative writer, and the, the, with that then, the, I give you the, the Olive Senior writer, okay? <laughs> Do I have to say any more? Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
Thank you. Is the sound good? Just need to check. Okay. Damas y caballeros, buenas tardes. That's the extent of my Spanish. But hello, everyone, um, and thank you, Dr. Fit, for that um, lovely introduction. I always feel as if it's my eulogy, you know, when people talk about me like that. Um, and anyway, it's a real pleasure to be here, and thank you to the English department for hosting this, and thank you all for coming. I'm going to read a very, very, very short story. I, I chose it's very, very short. And then I'll read you a selection of my poem. Um, this is a story that I wrote a long time ago, but it's coming out in a, a new collection of my stories called The Pain Tree, P A I N, Tree, that um, should be out next month. The story is called Moonlight. I always found it hard to sleep with a moon like that, falling through the window and right across my bed. One night, I got up and climbed out through the window onto our back veranda. And after that, I went walking outside in the yard, wherever there was moonlight. For no reason, if anyone had asked. I just felt restless. In my nightgown and bare feet, I would wander around the yard and take the night in, gaze at the moon and the heavens full of stars till I could almost feel myself floating away. Then I'd pull myself back to earth and hoist myself up through the window and go back to bed and sleep soundly. I wasn't afraid. At that point, I was never afraid. Not of lizards or or ghosts or robbers of hard sums or long words, which is probably why my grandmother had ended up calling me too biggish and force ripe whenever she visited. Growing up before her time, I heard her say, but I didn't mind. She'd only started to say that after I said I was too big to sit in her lap, which was true. What would she have said if she saw me climbing out of my window at night? Only Darwin, or dog, saw me from the back veranda where he slept, but he merely lifted his head with his straight up and sniffed to let me know he was there and on the job of guarding our house. Darwin was too dignified to make any unnecessary sound. He only barked at strangers. One night, I was so busy wandering around and gazing upwards, I didn't even realize I was room. I nearly jumped out of my skin when I heard a man's voice inside and Darlene's voice saying, no, no, then a man's voice. I stood still, listening. The voice again, his voice, my father's, speaking rough in a way that spoke to me or my mother. What was he doing in his room? I closed my eyes and I think I held my breath too long. I felt the world turning upside down. I knew that I had to get away from making a sound that no one should know I walked in the moonlight. I tiptoed to my window and climbed my feet trembling all the while. I shut the window and got into bed and pulled the covers even over my head for I was suddenly cold all over as if I'd taken a chill. Next morning, I looked at my father as he sat at the breakfast table reading the papers in between taking bites of his bacon and eggs, as he always does. And I looked at Darlene, softly paddling around, padding around, barefooted, as she came and went from the kitchen, bringing our breakfast, pouring our orange juice and my father's coffee, clearing the table, not speaking unless spoken to never showing on her face. I looked at my mother. She looked the same as she always did, peaceful, never showing anything either, never raising her voice. I began to wonder if I had been dreaming, but that night and many nights after, I couldn't sleep, and I stood by my window for hours, listening and watching. I saw my father, like a shadow, coming and going between our house and the maid's quarters where Darlene slept. Though nobody noticed, I became a different person. 
I couldn't look at my father springing to my eyes. I was looking at my mother in case she saw something I didn't want her to see. So I started to look away. I stopped eating because I couldn't swallow anything Darlene had cooked. School summer holidays now, and it was just me and them. I watched them. I had nothing to do. For the first time, brothers and sisters. But nobody behaved differently as far as I could see. And when there was no moonlight and I couldn't see anything, I slept like a log. When moonlight came again, I didn't feel like going outside. I didn't to the window. I wrapped myself in the sheet from head to toe so I couldn't see anything and suffered from the heat. I wanted to ask my mother to drapes to shut out the moonlight. I began to feel fearful, though I wasn't sure why. When next my grandmother came, I cried because I fell and scraped my knee, and she said, don't be such a baby, and I cried again. One morning, I came to the table for breakfast, and it was my mother in the kitchen. My father didn't notice anything until my mother came out with a percolator and poured his coffee. He must have seen her white hand instead of Darlene's black one in his cup, and he looked up and asked, where's Darlene then? My mother finished pouring, her hands sp steady, spilling not a drop. And then she went and turned over her cup and poured. I paid her off, she said. She's still standing and holding her percolator. She's four months pregnant. She placed the percolator on the trivet and sat down. Oh, really, my father said. And I watched as he absentmindedly poured milk into his coffee, though he normally didn't take milk and sweet. My mother saw it too, but she didn't say anything. Then he picked up the sugar bowl and put four teaspoons in. Did she say who the father is? He asked as he slowly stirred. I didn't ask. I know who the father is, my mother said, and she sipped from her cup. Milk, no sugar. Her voice was the same as always. Oh, from one to the other, and I caught the quizzical smile on my father's face. Oh, yes, said my mother in the same soft voice. She looked squarely at my father now. The dog never barked. My father said nothing then. He gave her a little smile and took his first sip. I expected him to make a face, but he didn't seem to mind the milk. He took up his folded newspaper as always and started to read. My mother buttered her toast. Nothing more was said. My father finished his breakfast and left for work, kissing my mother on her forehead as usual. My mother got a new maid. Darlene was never mentioned. Life went on as always. But I didn't feel biggish anymore. I wish my grandmother would come so I could sit in her lap and bury her in her bosom. Thank you. Thanks. I'm going to read a selection of poems from, from my um, various poetry books. And I'm going to start off reading one um, for the people who came to my talk on Panama, because um, the poem that I wrote was in the Canal Zone Library doing research for my book. And I think I told everybody I cried almost every day because I was so shocked at what I was discovering. It's a little poem. Um, it's not a great poem, but it's one of my early poems. Um, and it's called Searching for Grandfather. In Cologne, I searched for my grandfather without connection, not even the message of his name in the phone book. Along the line, I found my grandfather disconnected at Culebra, hacking at the cut he coughed his brains loose and shook, but it was only malaria. Yolanda, as they shipped him home on the deck of a steamer, his mind fractured, but his fortune intact, $28.02, silver. What he had learned to do really well in Colon was wash corpses. At home, the village was too poor to patronize. He was the one that died. His sisters laid him out in a freshly made coffin and cried. There was nothing left of the silver roll to weigh down his eyes. 
For although his life had been lacking in battle, they didn't want him to see that on this voyage out, he still traveled steerage. And um, just to change. I mean, I do write humorous stuff as well. I mean, it's, I realize it's been a bit serious. Um, because I like, a lot of my stories have humor in them, although I do subjects because I think, I like the idea of seducing people with laughter over the head. You know, that's a good technique. <laughs> it's better than, um, <laughs> anyway. Um, I'll just read, read a little, share with you a story that um, one of my friends read this poem to her grandchildren and one of the grandchildren who was 11 at the time wrote a story based on the last line of this poem and um, so I'll read the poem and I'll tell you the story because it's it's really the nicest thing that can happen to an, a writer you know and you inspire somebody especially a child respond to something um, it's called Ginep and I, I, is, I think you call that Hagua here or it's Hagua in other Spanish. Oh, you say um, because it's it's also one of the sacred plants of the Tangino and the um, natives throughout Central and South America. My explanation is always longer than this point. You know what it you know what Hennepa is. I mean, I don't know how popular it is here, but okay, because kids just can't wait for Guinep season to come. So you'll understand. Our mothers have a thing about. Mind you don't eat ginep in your good clothes, it will stain them. Mind you don't climb ginep tree, you will fall. Mind you don't swallow ginep seed inside you. The thing about ginep, they're secretly consuming it. So, as line goes, once upon a time, his mother sitting on the back steps with a big bowl of ginep in her, in her lap, and she, she's eating ganep, eating ganep, eating ganep, and she goes, mm, mm because she swallows one. And next thing you know, her belly starts to grow. And it grows and grows, so she goes to the doctor who says, oh, don't worry, you're going to have a baby. So she then goes into the hospital to have the baby, and what does she have? Any guesses? She has a baby ganep tree, of course. So, <laughs> so the story goes, like a good mother, she takes her strange offspring home and she plants it in her garden. In two twos, it grows up and it bears. And what does it bear? Any guesses? <laughs> Human babies, of course. So, <laughs> so the story goes, her 11 children come and her strange new siblings and they hold hands dance around the tree, singing a little song they make, make up for the occasion, which goes, we not eat more, for it give we plenty pain, make we poor. <laughs> I assume you understood the Creole in the last. So, <laughs> um, most of my work um, is both my fiction, nonfiction, and so on, is concerned with history, and particularly the history of the Americas, and I put it that way. Um, but I'm concerned about larger issues, and the next poem I'm going to read is just a, a sample of that. Um, I started to write a series of poems called Who, Who, Built, the Pyramid, Who, Who Built the Pyramids? Um, and it was about the people who, of the world who do all the dirty work, like, you know, the people who built the Panama Canal and so on. And um, th this one is, um, it's about the time when all lace was handmade and was um, made with uh, um, silk thread. And I was really appalled to, to um, I went to a museum and I was appalled to learn the history of lace making. So I wrote this poem, which is called Lace Maker. And um, it's, uh, sorry, I'm just trying to find it. And the, the thing about it is lace, because it was made with, with silk thread, it had to be made by young girls whose hands had not Persons by any other work, need soft, fine hands, and they had to work in places that were damp 
so the thread wouldn't break. And so they were put to work in damp cellars or even uh, with the cows, because, you know, cows seem to have, I don't know, stuff that keeps the air damp and goes into the atmosphere. And um, so it meant that their lives were very, they either went blind very early or, um, or they died from um, t tuberculosis, you know, that, those kinds of infections or diseases. And um, what is really sad about the story is they spent a lifetime working on two yards of lace because it was such a, a, you know, kind of process, which meant that lace, handmade lace, was extremely expensive, but, and it could only be bought and worn by the, the richest people. And it's interesting that um, during the French Revolution, the, the aristocrats were busily <laughs> giving their lace to their servants. And after the French Revolution, the, the um, number of handmade lace makers in Europe fell dramatically. So for some reason, which I can't remember, I titled this poem um, 1794, it's Lace Maker. Attached to my bobbins, like the spider, I with no time on, spin out a lifeline to hang on. Then I make the noose to form the whole air tangible as breath in this damp cellar. Round it I weave the thread of silk which will age to palest cream a crew ivory, age into charming o lace. I envy the spider in inches my life edges by. Her ladyship so many yards for her ruff. My lord, years of work for each cuff. My lord bishop, three quarters of my life to trim his alb. Like the spider, I grow brittle and dry. Like its web, pale and strong. My lace, kept moist for good tension, urges on fine as foam on the ocean, which I'll never see. For my eyesight's opalescent as shell now. My vision translucent as yet my skeletons of thread stay delicate as webs. Like the fly, it's the holes I'm mesmerized by. When I die, I'll go to my grave in coarse linen, no edging, but my virginal hands will not cease from signing punto in aria, stitches in air, never cease from making nooses for my lord, my lady. Meantime, the spider expects for our traps to be sprung, for lace trains to swing in blooded air. What a waste of good lace. What a waste of my lifetime. Thank you. Um, all the other poems that I'm going to read are located in the I always like to say that the historical figure that I like most to hate or who has yielded so much creative work for me is Christopher Columbus. <laughs> um, because I, I truly believe that um, Thilidate that reverberates down to us in that it set off... Um, what it, what, it set off a power quality which which we haven't sorted or solved in in this the so-called new world so a lot of my poems um have to do with that encounter with columbus um, and i've done a lot of research too on on the indigenous peoples of the caribbean because that's also something that you know i have wanted to know about coming especially from the english-speaking islands we're never told anything about the Taino, we were just simply told there were these simple little Arawaks that Columbus met and they all died off and that's the end of it in the history books of the English-speaking Caribbean. And it's only now actually that people are beginning to get interested in this aspect of our heritage, even though our favorite food in Jamaica is cassava bread, which is made exactly the way the, the native peoples have always made it. Okay, I'm going to... Um, I'm going to read... Uh, Columbus, one of my poems about Columbus, as you know, he, he only found his way to the West Indies because he followed the birds, a flight of birds, I mean. So, 
Um, I hope I'm not offending any big Columbus fans in this room, but... <laughs> And um, this is a poem called The Pull of Birds, and it's, you can't see I like poems that, where the shapes reflect um, the content. And in this um, poem, I have the three ships of Columbus, and then the, the birds flying to out distance in terms of the shape. The Pull of Birds. Colon, son and grandson of weavers, rejected that calling, but did not neglect craft, keeping two sets of books. On his first voyage, landfall received. Where was Japan? He sailed on, praying for a miracle to center him in that unmarked immensity, as warp to woof. And suddenly from the north, a density of birds flying south, their autumn migration into westward passage. At such an auspicious conjunction, his charts he threw out. The flocks drew him south across the blue fabric of the Atlantic. Weary mariners, buoyed by the miracle of land soon, of birds flying across the moon. Birds seeking to outdistance three rivers, skimming the surface of the sea and send in skyward their doomsday utterance of hawks' bells tinkling endlessly, birds speeding to make landfall on a honey. And I've, been, I've written a number of poems um, that are based on Taino mythology. And one is um, cassava, or do you call it yuca here? Do you say cassava? <laughs> no. Yucca. Okay. Um, which, of course, was a tiny uh, staff of life. So um, you'll see. When the seven sisters signal rain, the mothers make ready, cradle cassava sticks for planting like children in their baskets. To each, they offer the incense of tobacco, water with their tears. Buried under each grave mound, their people's future here. Radiant roots penetrate Mother Earth, douse for water. Children of Yucca shoot up high, fertilized by Sun Father. In their gardens, the mothers tread softly, in dread lest they awaken sleep in Yucca without reason. Pray, pray, the newly risen one cries out, Cut me down, for you I die each season. This is my body. Come, dig me, peel me, grate me, squeeze me, sift me, spread me, heat me, give me life again. Um, I'm going to read three more poems. One is very long, and these are, um, I'm going to read our, as yet, but they're sort of along the same kind of themes. Um, this is a cruise ship leaving port at night, and I wrote this um, in Ocherius, Jamaica, really actually seeing a, a cruise ship <laughs> at night, beautifully lit up, and I, I remembered or re realized that I was standing very close to the spot where Columbus had landed in Jamaica in um, 1494. So, cruise ship leaving port at night. Full moon and wine and leaning the railing, imagining a time when other watchers from the shore gazed at the very sea 500 years and more ago as strangers floated in on galleons golden in the moonlight. Suddenly, to my right, a sight such as that one, a cruise ship leaving port, a sea of light, golden in the moonlight. I was as awestruck as those earlier watches from the shore must have been, except that my galleon was leaving, and the sea and sky, my heart, were not left empty and barefaced. 
for the fleecy clouds continued to scud across the marvelous star-studded sky. The little waves gambled like biblical lambs, and I was left with the land that I felt was still mine, at least as long as the wine and the full moon lasted. This, this one um, is called Dead Straight, and um, I don't know if anybody has been to Jamaica recently, you'll notice that suddenly we have all these dead straight highways, which is very nice for traveling, but it leaves me with great regret because it's, it's just it's taking away all the memories of my driving along the coastal roads which follow the sea. All of that land now belongs to um, all-inclusive hotels, so Jamaicans are excluded from, even from the view, you know, so, um, so yeah, this, this, this poem is in, the, is, is in that context of um, sort of a kind of anger at whatever. <laughs> Dead straight. I'm traveling back home to you, but it's an omen. My road maps creased and torn along dead straight lines. The hill and gully ride is over now, and I'm flat out on the dead straight highway with a toll. The coastline as I try to make it home to you, through a forest of hotels as thick as thieves. For the sea, the coves and beaches, once seen through seaside shacks and palm trees, have been sold. And the rest of us are herded to the verge by this new highway, while over there, or beauty is extolled, bottled, and sold, and gated. In this new paradise, the only palms are greased, and somebody's beach umbrella has replaced the shade tree we once sat under, and the towns and settlements molder as they are bypassed. I can no longer witness on this highway with a toll that makes us modern as elsewhere for elsewhere is not where I'm meant to be. And a dead straight highway leaves no scent, no monument to the past, no scenic beauty for the curvature of my eye to take in, and em endless empty space is not in But perhaps there's no social meaning to this tirade after I'm just feeling lost without a map as I make it home to you pay the toll. You could see it simply as a love song to the curving cheekbones, bones, the mountains of your thighs, the hill and gully passion of your eyes, hair that is not dead straight, but very much otherwise. Thank you. I'm going to end by reading a, a rather long poem that I al always like to read at any, any reading I give. And um, it's called Meditation on Yellow, and it's written in the tropics. And um, it's, it's a poem in two parts. And the first part is um, in the voice of a nameless um, indigenous person <laughs> addressing a conquistador. And the second part is set in the contemporary period in the Caribbean. The speaker there could be a woman in the service industry or working in a hotel or something. And it's called uh, Meditation on Yellow because it's a color poem. So most of the references in it are to things that are yellow or shades of yellow. And of course, I'm the whole notion of gold as well as the motivation for the conquest of the Americas. And um, it opens with a quotation from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, who, um, who was into color symbolism, and his favorite color was yellow. And he was one, uh, once asked, what is your favorite shade And he said, the yellow of the Caribbean seen from Jamaica at three in the afternoon. So these are all the elements that I've woven together in this poem, Meditation on Yellow. At three, in the afternoon, you landed here at El Dorado, for heat engenders gold and fires the brain. Had I known, I would have brewed you up some yellow fever grass and arsenic. But for then, childlike in the yellow, so in exchange for a string of islands and two continents, you gave us a string of hawks bells, 
which was fine by me personally, for I have never wanted to possess things. I prefer copper anyway. The smell pleases our Lord Yukahuna or Mother Atabira. It's just that copper and gold hammered into one in, worn in the soul appendants favored by our holy men, fooled you into thinking we possessed the real thing. You are not the last by our patina. As for silver, I find that cold. The contents of our minds I would have let you take for one small mirror to catch and hold the sun. I like to feel alive to the possibilities of yellow. Lightning striking, perhaps as you sip tea at three in the afternoon, a bit incontinent despite your vast holdings, though I was gratified to note that despite the difference in our skins, our piss was exactly the same shade of yellow. I wished for you a sudden enlightenment that we were not the Indies, nor Café. No yellow peril here, though after you came plenty of bananas, oranges, sugarcane. You gave us these for maize, pineapples, guavas. In that respect, there was fair exchange. It was gold on your mind, gold the light in your eyes. Gold the crown of the Queen of Spain who had a daughter. Gold the prize of your life, the crown and glory, the gateway to heaven and altar, which I saw in Seville 500 years after. Though I couldn't help noticing, this filled me with dread. Silver was your armor. Silver the cross of your Lord. Silver the steel in your countenance. Silver the glint your sword, silver, the bullet I bite, golden, the maca, the weeds which mark our passing, the only servant on yellow streak. We were Indians, the red Indians, red Indians, we not golden, we were a shade too brown. At some hotel overlooking the sea, you can take at three in the afternoon, served by me, burnt black as toast for which management apologizes. But I've been traveling long across the sea in the sun hot. I've been slaving in the cane rows for sugar. I've been ripening coffee beans for your morning break. I've been dallying on the docks, loading your bananas. I've been toiling in orange for your marmalade. I've been peeling ginger for your relish. I've been chop chopping cocoa pods for your chocolate bars. I've been mining aluminum for your foil. And just when I thought I could rest, pour my own, something soothing like and lemon, cut my ten in the kitchen, take five. A new set of people arrived to lie bare-assed in the sun, wanting gold on their bodies, cane rose in their hair, with beads, even bells, as serving them. Coffee, tea, cocks, red striped beer, sensimila, I cane row in their hair with my beads. But still, they want more. Wanted strong, wanted long, wanted black, wanted green, wanted dread, I have to say, look, I'm tired now. I give you the land. I give you the breeze. I give you the beaches. I give you the yellow sand. I give you the golden crystals. And I reach a stage where, though I'm not impossible, I have to say, lump it or leave it. I can't give it. For one day, before I die from 500 years of servitude, I do to move from kitchen to front veranda Caribbean Sea, drinking real tea with honey and lemon, it well buttered with civil orange marmalade. I want to feel mellow in that three o'clock yellow. I want to feel, though you own the service, the communion plate, you don't own the tropics anymore. I want to feel you cannot take away the sun dropping by every day for a chat. I want to feel you 
stop Yalamaka bursting through the reminding us of what's buried there. Those street gals, those treges, Alamanda, Cassia, Pui, Golden Shower, flaunting themselves. I want to feel you can hear my song from my throat. You can hear the memory of my story. You cannot catch my rhythm for. You have to born with that. You cannot come ranging into rivers like both dancing in my garden, looking into rainbows. And I haven't had a drop to drink yet. You cannot reverse Bob Marley wailing, making me feel so mellow in that Caribbean yellow. At three o'clock, any day. Thank you. Okay. Um, I'm finished. Yes. <laughs> so. <laughs> Uh, yeah, are there questions or? Okay. Yeah. The, do you want to sit or do you want to stay standing for questions? Oh, I, I'll sit. Can you put it here? Can you put it here on the table for the question? No. Okay. Can you put it here on the microphone? Okay. Do I have to stand? Okay. <laughs> you change the technology. Okay. 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 <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. Now, now that this is over, I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> Pleasure uh, hearing you read your work. Thank you. Fantastic. So I was really taken. Uh, I recently reread uh, Summer uh, Lightning. I was really taken by the figure of Brother Justice. One hand, a machete, the other hand, the Bible. Mm -hmm. But more importantly, how both of those things are figured in his mind about how he projects himself into that fictionalized world of the story. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to know, uh, would you say that he's an emanation since he's your creation, he's an emanation of your being, or was he uh, uh, modeled after someone in <laughs> particular? Because wow. he's, he's a wonderful energy. Yeah. Um, Thank well, you. you know, all right, let me say that Sun Lightning was one of my, the first stories I wrote as an adult in that book. Uh, you know, that book consists of my very first stories. And I have to confess, I didn't know what I was doing. I just did them. So, it, I mean, it's only in retrospect that I, I have become aware of what I was doing. The stories arose based to a great extent on my childhood, people I, kn I knew, and so on. And so Brother Justice is a Rastafari, Rastafarian figure. And the name is telling you, and this was all unconscious on my, on my part to name him Brother Justice, but he really stands as a figure for for justice as necessary, and um, and and therefore, um, it's not that I was thinking of any of this consciously, but I'm really intrigued by by what you have to say and what you've seen in that figure, and I don't think he's that far from a lot of the, especially the early Rastafarians who. <laughs> who were religious, you know, the, the, their um, whole religious ideology was based on the Old Testament. And so this is in the traditional prophet who would bless you on one hand and strike you on the other if you, if you transgress. So I, pr I suppose, I mean, I grew up on the Bible and these biblical images, I mean, in my childhood I was terrified because I, of clouds because I thought, oh my God, God is going to just a cloud one day and strike me dead sort of thing. So I think all of these things were running, running in my head <laughs> when I wrote that story. But they were not conscious. I never made any conscious about writing any stories. I simply wrote them. Yes. You said when you started that you, that you in a sense, didn't know what you were doing. Mm -hmm. and I'm asking this question principally because I know there are young people yeah. who are taking writing classes and editing classes and things like that. Could you just talk a little bit about that whole process of, of starting? Yeah. When, when, when did you start? Why? When did you conceive of yourself as? Right? <laughs> OK, thanks. Well, um, my personal mythology is that I started to write before.
decided I was going to be a writer that age. But I think that's the age at which I learned to read. And one of the things my childhood very early on is that if, you, if I had my head buried in a book, adults would leave me alone. And I must have been a dreadful child because I, all I wanted in life was to be left alone, you know. So, um, but I've only, I, my earliest childhood, I was either going to be a writer or an artist or, you know, a creative person of some sort. Um, so I've, I, I wrote a lot as a child and, you know, submitted to competitions that you take. And I was very fortunate. I know I will get stoned for this by some people. I was very fortunate to have a British colonial education at the time I went to school because it, it gave me a very, very thorough grounding in life. Everything was language based. You had to write essays in every single class. And um, so that taught me a lot about writing. But I also, and this is especially to all you want to be there, I learned to write from reading. You know, if you want to be a writer, read, and I mean read critically, um, and read trying to understand what you don't tell me you want to be a writer, because to me, two sides of the same equation. So I never write in school. Um, I learned from writing at school. I learned from reading, just reading everything, reading throughout my childhood and so on. I did go to journalism school because I thought all the writers I knew had, you know, I had mentors and I had no mentors. And all the writers I knew about also wrote for the newspaper. So I just assumed that to, to be a writer, you have to be a journalist. And so I studied journalism, but I never really wanted to be a journalist. I, s I simply wanted to write. I wrote my first adult stories and poems while I was at university in Canada, supposedly studying to be a journalist. And, um, but I like to say that I wrote intuitively, meaning that I thought enough about writing by then so that I wrote my stories, but without being conscious of the techniques of writing. I did not know, for example, what point of view was until I started to, to teach writing. <laughs> to be honest with you. But at the same time, if you look at some of my early stories, I was really managing point of view quite nicely. I mean, there's one story, there are five different points of view. Um, and it's only when I was, uh, I started to, my books were out and, you know, people started asking me questions <laughs> at readings and things. And I, I started to teach writing and I said, oh my goodness, I better go and read up about something about writing. And that is when I learned the, the craft in that sense. And I'm not sure if that has been a good thing for me or not, because now as a writer, I'm much more self-conscious, you know, of craft than, than I was um, when I started. But the other thing that really helped me, although I, I never stayed in journalism, um, but I have to say that my first job was on a newspaper in Ligliner. That job and journalism school taught me a lot about writing. The main thing you need to know is cut, <laughs> you know, I mean, write tight. Um, and the other thing that it taught me, which I have to this day um, maintained throughout um, for everything I write, it doesn't matter whether it's a poem, it's a book, what I do, is that I'm writing for a reader. I'm not writing for myself. And if, if, you, if you want to connect, you have to see, in your mind's eye, you have to have someone that you are talking to. And I think that's a good device, especially for young writers. If, if, you know, if you're stuck, just imagine telling it. Because writing is communication. That's the whole point. And I think I learned that from journalism, that, that you must, um, it's, it's an act of communication. I know we all writing because our hearts are broken you know we all start writing about love and heartbreak and those things that's fine do it but you know you ha once you want to move on from there from from the person to uh, to connecting with a wider audience then you need to think of your audience it's not about you anymore it's about the person you're speaking to and what they are going to get saying and if you think in that way it will also buy 
you know, the manner in which you're communicating. And, and the, the, the other thing I learned from journalism is to grab the reader by the throat at the very beginning, <laughs> you know, because um, we were taught, uh, you know, your, your work is going to get cut from the bottom up. So the most important thing has to go in at the very start. And I think that still holds true for poetry um, and short stories as well. You, ha you have to give the reader something to hold on to so that they will follow you all the way through. Yes. Oh, well. Well, as a child, I read everything. And I still read everything, including what's on the matchbox. And when I go to the supermarket, I read everything on the product, if it's a new product. And, I, you know, I mean, I just, I'm just voracious that way. And as a child, I read, the, you know, the traditional Alice in Wonderland. I remember it was the first book I owned because I grew up in rural Jamaica, there weren't too many books around. And then I went to high school and read everything in, in the junior library. And this day, I sing the praises of the librarian who allowed me to go into the big people's library long before I reached the age. And I read out everything there, not understanding, I'm sure, a lot of it. But of course, this was European literature. That um, but the, the, I always say that the most, and of course, I grew up on the English literary canon, you know, Dickens and the rest of it, Shakespeare. I mean, we had to do a Shakespeare play, everything, every single year, so. Um, but I, I, I say that what, and I've always written as a child, and I always wanted to write, but the breakthrough for me as a adult or a young, when I was in my late teens, that w that's when I think I, I started to write serious stuff that it was eventually published. The breakthrough for me came through the American writers, because growing up in a British colony, um, everyone was very scornful of America, you know, and so we were never American literature, but on my own in the library, I discovered what, what is called the Southern Gothic, you know, people like McCullough's Truman Capote, I mean, he was my god at one point, and Flannery O'Connor, people like that. And, and the reason I think why this was such a break is that Truman Capote's book, for instance, Other Voices, Other Rooms, created a world that was like the world in which I lived. It was a multiracial world. If you know, this was South. And even some of his references to things and plants and so on was suddenly familiar to me in a way that English, you know, books set in England or Europe just did not have this familiarity. And so suddenly it's, it's as if these books and especially his work opened my eyes to the fact that I could write about my world, you know, the world I was living in because we were never encouraged to do this. And so this is how my first stories were born, because I, su I, you know, I suddenly realized that I had grown up that was really interesting, full of fascinating people. I grew up in a world that was both European and African, but you know, we were taught to that was African. It was, you know, if it wasn't European, it wasn't, that was the, the grand tradition was the European. But as a child, I used to hang on to whatever was going on in my village and so on. And so, in a way, the stories in Summer Lightning were a way of acknowledging the, v the validity of the life, my own life, you know, the life I'd, I'd lived, I'd grown, the place I'd grown up in, but which I was not taught to celebrate, you know. Um, so that was, that was a very major influence for me, those American writers. And then the other, um, I mean, I, there was a time in my life I read just about every new book. You know, at that time, you could keep up with what was being published. Now you can't. But the next big um, significant set of writers for me were the Latin Americans. Marquez, um, Puig, um, and especially Jorge Amado. Um, because I, I have an interest in, um, in uh, let us say, African and Native American spirituality and so on and so forth. And Amado showed me how to write again about ordinary people 
and, and bring in these, uh, I hate to use the word magical realist elements because that's, you know, but you know what I mean, to, to do that. And, um, his, and especially, I mean, there are his famous novels, but his early work when he was this young communist, um, you know, plantation owner, writing about the poor people really moved me. And of course, when I read 100 Years of Soul, I thought, okay, I can stop writing. It's been written. And I, you know, I still feel this way. So now, amazingly, I have gone back to, to um, reading all the writers I hated in my school years, namely Charles Dickens. I read Dickens, I reread Dickens nonstop now. And um, some of those earlier, earlier writers as well. I, it's very hard for me now to keep up with what's happening in writing. I try to keep up with Caribbean literature. And um, my favorite, one of my favorite authors just died, Terry Pratchett. I'm not, I don't know, is there, are there any Pratchett fans there? Whoops, no? All right. Greatest novelist in, in the English-speaking world, but that's just me. Um, he really, I'm not really into fantasy, but Pratchett's fantasy is really um, satire, and it's a critique of, of the modern world, but set in this world, which is this imaginary place. And um, so my, my reading is very, very Catholic, I must say. And I read a lot of poetry. You know, I, that's what I read too, sort of. And, uh, and for my bedtime reading is detective fiction, I confess. <laughs> I, I, you know, mystery or something before I go to bed. So I, I'm, I'm a very... Um, I'm not a snob about literature, you know what I mean? I, I embrace any, all forms of literature as long as it's well written, you know, so. In what way would you say your relocation in uh, Toronto, Canada has influenced your writing? <laughs> <laughs> I don't think it has really. <laughs> um, I haven't written about in my, I have a collection of short stories that's coming out next month, and there, I think there's only one story in it that's set in Canada, or it's a, about a little girl who moves from Jamaica to Canada, although those stories have all been written since I've been living there. Um, I don't, I'm not, they say write about what you know, and I'm not, I still have so much I want to write about what I know, you know, I feel passionate about which is basically the Caribbean. And um, the thing about Canada, I like living there, but I don't feel the kind of with it that would ena enable me to write about it. You know? But it's me living outside of Canada. I mean, I like the idea of going back and forth because it's given me a different perspective on, on my own place, you know, my home. My home is still um, Jamaica, my spiritual home. So. There's one. Can you speak a little about your process in terms of writing poetry and how you frame and how you approach the page? <laughs> I don't approach the empty page. Okay, um, my, okay, you have to understand, I'm writers who writes every day or even every every month I like to think that a lot of writing goes on in my head before I put you know I put anything on paper but um, when it comes to poetry I I look at it, a pearl is formed a poem is formed like a pearl where you get a germ <laughs> grit bit of grit and the poem forms around it I think that's my process for writing poetry I have to have it, it could be anything, an image, or a word, or an idea, or something. And then so it's in my, in my head, and, and my unconscious or subconscious, whatever it is, works on that over a period of time. Uh, all my poetry books so far are, have, been, have consisted of poems written around a certain theme, because I like that. I find that pushes me to get it done. So my last book is called um, Shell, and it, it really is about history. It's about plantation history and the remnants in like the great houses and 
so on. But to write this, what I did and what I do for poetry, as well as everything else, which I nobody else does this, but I do the research. So I got this idea of a shell, and then I read just about anything that was written. You know, I just uh, and and so the the. Um, the book is divided into parts. It's not just the shell we think of as the, the heart. Um, but, it, but I have like shell out, um, shell blow, shell shock, shell an empty shell as the, um, the way the book is divided. And so, you know, so I'm working on those themes. But shell, shell is the, the word around which all this was grew. But I spent years just taking notes about shell. So when I came to write the poems, I didn't look at the notes because, you know, all of this was in my mind. One thing about doing research is that it gives you a vocabulary, you know, a vocabulary that's derived from the subject matter. So my book, Gardening in the Tropics, again, I'm using the metaphor of gardening to explore Caribbean history. Or the other book, um, Over the Roofs of the World, which is the, the themes are birds and thread. And so I find that I need, I need to ha have those threads, let's call it that. I need to have a word, I need to have something to think about and focus on, and the poem will come. But I just can't sit and, and write a poem like that. I don't do it. But you know what, everyone, you have to find your own way. This is the whole point. We all have different approaches. And you just have to find your way. And um, it might take a while. I didn't start off doing what I, what I do, you know, in, in poetry. I, I, I was writing about the broken hearts and everything. Start. So, so just, just do it, you know. <laughs> May I just say something? I don't know if I have enough. Oh, sorry. But I, I, one of the things I, 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 I like to think I write too much, too long, you know, and I'm trying to write shorter and shorter. So I started to write um, um, postcard poems. Two, two pictures I had taken. I, I took a pic, uh, you know, I take a picture and then I'd write a poem to suit the picture. And I brought along a set, and you're welcome to take one. I hope there's enough for everyone. Because originally, I used to, I did about a dozen, and I did everything myself. I designed, put them together, and printed them myself. So only special people got a copy. But then my printer broke. So I, I, I'm sorry, I went to the print shop and got a lot done. So I'd love you to have one. It's, it's about five different, different ones. So... Sorry, I just wanted to say that. And I'll put them out here. Thank you very much. Thank you. And we're going to be slowly leaving the room. We'll be slowly leaving the room and taking things down and, and doing things here so there's time. So if you have other kinds of questions and you want to just talk to the Olive Senior, or make plans to see if she's interested in going to have some coffee. She loves coffee, so if you, the, the, she's, she's not one of these tea drinkers, you know. She loves coffee. So if you want to sit down and have some coffee with her and talk a little bit more afterwards, well, come, introduce yourselves, and I'm sure for a while. Okay, but thank you very much. <laughs>